In this video, I'm going to uh, briefly sort of reintroduce the concept of eigenvectors and eigenvalues, uh, and I'm going to go through some of the tricky parts of what it means and how they work, and I'll also work through some examples of how to actually find them. Let's start by uh, reviewing a little bit what a linear operator is, right? We established that a linear operator acting on a function takes that function and turns it into some other function in general. Um, it also has to satisfy these two conditions that uh, basically distributivity and associativity. We can also apply this exact same concept to vectors. The only difference being that our operator now takes uh, an input vector and turns it into some new vector. And just like there are eigenfunctions of a linear operator that are just scaled by the operator by an amount dictated by uh, their corresponding eigenvalue, there are also eigenvectors, which are vectors that are just scaled by the uh, linear transformation, and how much they're scaled by is dictated by their corresponding eigenvalue. And again, these eigenvectors are any vector that is only uh, scaled by the operation but isn't rotated at all by it. So it will maintain the same direction that it had before the operation, or possibly if its eigenvalue is negative, it would be pointing the opposite direction. But it would still lie along the same line as before it was operated on. You are all already aware um, of examples of linear operators that act on vectors, right? Can you think of anything that takes one vector and turns it into another? We call those matrices. A matrix times a vector gives us another vector. We're only going to work with square matrices, so if our vector is n-dimensional, meaning it has n components, then our matrix is going to be n by n-dimensional, meaning it has n rows and n columns. We could label the elements of our uh, matrix a, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. But usually what we do is we just label each element with the symbol that we use to represent the matrix, in this case A, with subscripts where the first subscript represents the row that it's in and the second subscript represents the column that it's in. So the row 1, column 1 element is A11. The row 1, column 2 element is A12. The row 2, column 1 element is A21, and so on. And an n by n matrix times an n-dimensional uh, vector is going to give us another n-dimensional vector, right? So if I, the, the final result is always going to have the number of rows of the thing on the left and the number of columns of the thing on the right. Well, our matrix on the left has n rows and our column on the right has one column. So the result is going to have n rows in one column, which is simply an n-dimensional column vector. The rules of uh, matrix multiplication already satisfy the distributive and associative properties. And so our matrices, by default, satisfy the requirements needed to be a linear operator. If we're given a particular matrix, maybe like this one, how would I go about actually finding the eigenvectors of this matrix and the corresponding eigenvalues for each of those eigenvectors? Well, if a vector x is an eigenvector of our operator or matrix A, then a times x has to be equal to a number, which we're going to label as a lambda, times x again. In other words, x has to simply be rescaled by our operator a. This equation is usually called the eigenvalue equation because it actually allows us uh, to solve for the eigenvalues. Typically, we find the eigenvalues first, and we use those to find the corresponding eigenvectors. Um, but it is possible to go the other way as well. In order to actually go about solving this, first what we want to do is we want to factor out the eigenvector x. So one way we can try to do that is we can rearrange it to look something like this. But it's a little bit problematic because as you see here, we're subtracting a number from a matrix, and I can't actually do that. A matrix is, you know, a matrix. How do I subtract a single number from that? In order to get around that, I'm going to insert the identity matrix next to the lambda. In other words, I'm multiplying lambda times the identity matrix, which is the matrix uh, with ones all down its main diagonals and zero everywhere else. The identity matrix takes another matrix or vector and returns it to itself. This quantity in the parentheses over here is really just a matrix. It's the matrix A minus the matrix lambda times the identity, which is just this little blue matrix over here. This represents a system of equations. If I actually carry out the matrix multiplication, 
row by column, I get these two equations. But it turns out that this is not actually that useful. The problem is that x1 and x2 represent the components of the eigenvector of my matrix. They have that specific meaning. They're not arbitrary, I just don't know what they are yet. So I don't know what x1 and x2 are. Maybe they are, maybe x1 is, can be 2 and maybe x2 can be negative 1, who knows. So the problem is each of these equations can be satisfied in one of two different ways. This top equation could be satisfied by lambda equals 1 or by x1 equals 0. And if x1 is equal to 0, then it no longer tells me anything about what lambda is because 0 times any number would give me 0. Likewise, the bottom equation would give me the same problem. This could, equation would be satisfied if lambda is equal to negative 1 or if x2 is equal to 0. But once again, if x2 is 0, then lambda could be anything. So this doesn't really tell me all the information I would like about lambda. It does, does tell me that lambda equals 1 or lambda equals negative 1 are both possible ways to satisfy this system of equations, but they're not the only uh, way to solve the system of equations. So this is not a great way to go about it. In this case, as you'll see later, we actually have extracted some useful information from it, but there's a better way to do this. And it involves determinants. So it turns out that for this equation over here, for the eigenvalue equation to be satisfied, it can be shown, and I'm not going to show why, I'm not going to prove that this is the case, but it can be shown that the only way in general for this equation to be satisfied is for the determinant of the matrix A minus lambda times the identity to be equal to zero. I'll explain what a determinant is in just a second. Uh, but first of all, a couple way, different ways of representing a determinant. One way is, as I've written here, by writing DET in front of the matrix. Another way uh, that we can represent the determinant is using the same uh, notation that we use to represent magnitudes, just two vertical lines on either side. And so the determinant of this matrix can be written as... Uh, rather than like the little brackets that we normally use to represent a matrix, we can represent it like this. All these three different uh, ways of uh, writing things mean the same thing, right? So here I have the determinant of this matrix here. Here I've replaced the brackets with just vertical lines on either side to indicate that I'm taking the determinant of whatever's between them. And here I've actually replaced a minus lambda i with the matrix itself. So what the heck is this determinant thing that I'm talking about? Uh, most of you, or a lot of you probably don't know what this is. Some of you may have learned it in pre-calculus. Obviously, if you're in linear algebra, you should know this by now. Um, so let's talk about what a determinant is. The closest analogy that I can give you, not a completely accurate one, is that the determinant is to a matrix as the magnitude is to a vector. So the magnitude of a vector tells us its size. The determinant of a matrix, in some sense, tells us the size of the matrix. It's a little bit more of an abstract quantity, and it's a little bit more of a complex thing, but it is the closest analogy that I can give you. Calculating the determinant of a general n by n matrix is actually really awful, really tedious, very frustrating, and almost no one in their right minds would ever do this other than making a computer do it for you. Luckily, we're only going to worry about determinants of two by two matrices. We're never actually gonna to have to worry about anything larger than that. And the determinant of a two by two matrix is actually quite simple. It's equal to the product of A times D minus the product of B times C. That's it, that's all there is to it. And rather than remembering AD minus BC, you can always think of it as the product of the main diagonal elements minus the product of the off diagonal elements. Um, so for a two by two matrix, computing the determinant is really pretty straightforward. And again, that's all we're going to need. So let's go back to our previous example um, and let's use this. So what we said earlier is that our uh, eigenvalue equation can only be true if the determinant of this matrix is equal to zero. So let's compute the determinant of that matrix. It's the product of the main diagonal terms, which is 1 minus lambda 
times minus 1 minus lambda, minus the product of the off-diagonal uh, terms, which is 0. And we are then going to set this equal to 0 because that was our condition uh, for this uh, eigenvalue equation to be true. And this expression right here is often given a name as well. This is, this is sometimes called the characteristic polynomial or the secular equation. At this point, we basically have the possible values of lambda. There are two ways we can approach this. One, we can identify that this is just 1 minus lambda times minus 1 minus lambda is equal to 0. And this is already you know, factored nicely so that we can read the two roots of this quadratic expression. Uh, there are two ways for this expression on the left to be equal to 0. One way is for 1 minus lambda to be 0, which means lambda is equal to plus 1. Or minus 1 minus lambda is equal to 0, in which lambda would have to be equal to negative 1. It won't always be this easy. In this case, because our off-diagonal terms are both 0, our determinant came out pre-factored for us, so we could immediately read off the roots. But generally speaking, you'll end up with a quadratic expression. This term won't be 0, and you'll have to multiply things out, and you'll have to factor or use the quadratic formula in order to find the actual roots of the expression to find the two possible values of lambda. In all the cases we're going to consider, lambda, there will always be two values of lambda. We're going to have a quadratic expression. Our quadratic expressions are going to be nice enough that we're always going to end up with two unique values uh, of lambda, which means our operators, the ones that we're going to deal with, at least for now, are only ever going to have two eigenvalues. In order to be able to differentiate between these two eigenvalues, I like to label my eigenvalues. I'll call the first one lambda 1 and the second one lambda 2. There's no particular reason why I'm labeling one of them lambda 1 and one lambda 2. I could do it the other way around, um, but it's nice to be able to refer to them other than by writing down their value. But this is big. We just found the eigenvalues of the operator 1, 0, 0, minus 1. This means that there are vectors out there that when operated on by this matrix will return themselves or the negative of themselves. In other words, the vector x1, as I've labeled it, is an eigenvector of our operator with an eigenvalue of plus 1, and the vector x2 is an eigenvector of our matrix operator with an eigenvalue of negative 1. Now we have the eigenvalues of our matrix, so how do we go about finding our eigenvectors? The way that we do this is we go back to uh, our eigenvalue equation, which is basically just, again, rewriting these expressions, but we're consolidating the vector terms. Before moving on, you should make sure to take the time to understand how these two, how this equation over here is the same as this equation right here, and how the second equation up top is the same as the second equation here. These are the two expressions that are going to allow us to find x1 and x2. And we're going to do that by explicitly writing out this matrix. I should point out a potential point of confusion based on the notation that I've chosen to use. I've labeled my two eigenvectors x1 and x2 with little vectors. And for better or for worse, I've labeled the components of my vector x1 as x1 and x2 as well. But I want to emphasize that these components are the components of the vector x1. This x2 has got nothing to do with this. Um, I probably could have chosen better notation, but it's uh, too late. The next step is to actually plug in the value of lambda 1 into here, and then we can go about solving the system of equations to relate x1 and x2. The first equation to us is given by the first row, times the column here, and the second equation is given to us by the second row times the column. And in both cases, uh, those uh, row column products are equal to zero on the right-hand side. So what is this actually telling us? Well, the first equation tells us nothing at all. Uh, it tells us that zero is equal to zero. So that doesn't really tell us much. But the second equation tells us that negative 2x2 is equal to 0. This implies that x2 must be equal to 0. The only way for this second equation to be true is for the value of x2 to be equal to 0. 
While the second equation let us determine the value of x2, it has to be 0, neither equation tells us anything about x1. This is actually all the information we need. This is telling us that any vector with any value of x1 and a value of 0 for x2 will be an eigenvector of our operator a with an eigenvalue of plus 1, which is what we plugged in to, solve, to find this. We can verify this by multiplying a vector um, with this form by our original matrix to see what happens, and we do in fact find uh, that we end up with the same vector we started. Now let's go back and do the same analysis with our second uh, characteristic equation, or with our second eigenvalue equation, to find the eigenvectors associated with our second eigenvalue, lambda 2, which is equal to negative 1. So the first thing we do is we plug in the numbers into our, we plug in our actual matrices and our actual eigenvalues. Um, we then multiply that by two arbitrary coefficients of our vector x2. We set the whole thing equal to zero. When we plug in lambda two equals to negative one, we end up with a matrix that looks like this. And once again, we can do our matrix multiplication to find our two, uh, our system of two equations. And just like last time, one of our equations doesn't really tell us anything useful, and the other equation tells us that x1 is equal to 0. This is the same kind of thing that we had over here. On the left, when we, had, when we used our eigenvalue of plus 1, we found that x2 was 0, but x1 could be anything. This time we found that x1 is 0, and since neither of our equations tells us anything about x2, x2 can be any value and still satisfy these uh, equations. So if we complete this analysis, it means that any vector x2 of the form of x1 equals 0, and the second component being any arbitrary value, um, will be an eigenvector with an eigenvalue of negative 1. And to check our work, we can always multiply uh, our eigenvector, or our set of eigenvectors x2 by our original operator, uh, and when we work it out, we find that we do indeed get negative 1 times the vector we started with. So if I ask how many eigenvectors does the operator um, given by our matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1 have, uh, you might be tempted to say two. There's this one, and there's this one. Technically speaking, there are an infinite number of them because x1 can be any value and x2 can be any value. So any vector of this form with any number in x1 from negative infinity to positive infinity, or in fact, even any complex number, will be an eigenvector with an eigenvalue of plus 1. Same on the right-hand side with our second eigenvector. Any complex number substituted in for the second component uh, will once again give us an eigenvector with an eigenvalue of negative 1. In other words, vectors of the form on the left are not changed by this operation. Any vector that only has a first component value will be completely unchanged by this operation. On the other hand, any vector that only has a second component value will be flipped. If we think of the first component as the x-axis value and the second component as the y-axis value, then the x value is unchanged and the y value is flipped. And so this can be thought of as a reflection over the x-axis. In quantum mechanics, physical states have to have a magnitude of 1. They have to be unit vectors or their states have to be represented by unit vectors because, again, ultimately they're related to probabilities, and when you sum up all the probabilities, you always have to end up with a 1. So the only eigenvectors that we're going to care about in the context of this course are the eigenvectors that have a magnitude of 1. In other words, we're going to care about the unit eigenvectors. There are an infinite number of eigenvectors with eigenvalue of plus 1, but there is only one unit vector with an eigenvalue of plus 1. It's the vector 1, 0. Likewise, there is only one unit vector with an eigenvalue of minus 1. It's the vector 0, 1. Technically, this is a lie. Um, technically, x1 can be equal to 1 
or it can be e to the i theta uh, instead of one, and in x two, the one could also be e to the i theta. So they could be complex valued. Um, but by convention, we use the positive real unit valued eigenvectors to represent our set of eigenvectors. If possible, it might not always be possible to find real valued eigenvectors. In this case, finding the unit eigenvalues was really easy, right? One of the components was zero, and the other components uh, was, uh, was not zero, so we just pick the non-zero component to be equals one, and we can move on with our lives. But that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes it will be a little bit tricky, and in order to actually determine the unit eigenvalues for each of our, or, sorry, the unit eigenvectors for each of our eigenvalues, we'll have to once again go through a normalization process. In order to do this, we take our eigenvector, and we set its magnitude equal to one. Let's say, for example, that I have an eigenvector of i and minus two. The first step is to rewrite this as simply n times i and minus two, where n is going to be our normalization factor. Um, we, it's just a number, uh, and we're going to figure out what value does n need to have in order to ensure that um, our resulting eigenvector has a magnitude of one. Um, recall from above or from in general, a scalar multiple of an eigenvector will also always be an eigenvector. Um, so I can I am free to do this. If I know that this vector i minus 2 is an eigenvector, then any number times that vector will also be an eigenvector, and it will also have the same eigenvalue. So this isn't really changing anything. It's just allowing me to figure out what does n need to be so that this will end up having a unit magnitude. Recall that to actually calculate the magnitude of a vector, or the magnitude squared of a vector, it's equal to the complex conjugate of the row vector times the column vector. We usually represent this using Dirac notation. Carrying out the matrix multiplication, we end up with this. Now, ultimately, again, remember what we want is the magnitude to be equal to one. If the magnitude is one, then the magnitude squared also needs to be equal to one. And this allows us to find that n squared is equal to 1 over 5, or that n is equal to 1 over the square root of 5. That lets us finally rewrite our uh, eigenvector as a unit vector, and we just end up sticking a 1 over square root of 5 in front for a final unit eigenvector of 1 over the square root of 5 times the vector i minus 2. This is the process of finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors of any 2 by 2 matrix. It doesn't matter what the 2 by 2 matrix is, the process is always going to be the same, at least in our purposes. There are occasionally, if you try to do more practice on your own, for example, it is possible to encounter matrices with weird properties. For example, uh, where you might have two different eigenvectors, uh, but they have the same eigenvalue. And it can be a little bit tricky to work out what's going on in those cases. But fortunately, we're actually never going to worry about any of those in this class. So if you end up doing practice elsewhere and you find that something really weird is happening, um, if all you care about is understanding um, the material for this course, you can just ignore it and move on. Of course, if you want to understand the more general uh, process of finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors of general operators or matrices, then uh, you are welcome to try to piece together what's happening. Uh, so that's it for now. Um, hopefully this was helpful. Uh, again, you can really work through any other matrix using this exact same procedure. The only difference is some parts of a, of a particular operator might lead to more annoying math. In particular, one of the places where things are likely to be messier is um, solving our uh, characteristic uh, polynomial equations. That's it uh, for this uh, video. Hopefully that helps you understand how to go about finding the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a two by two matrix. Until next time.